Bimi should be the trust seal for um, email? First off, it's not a trust element. Welcome to this week's or this edition of Deliberability TV. Myself, Anthony Mitchell, um, co host Florian Vierka, and this week, Jakob Olexa. Is that, is that how you pronounce your name? Is that correct? Yes. That's correct. Fantastic. The CEO and founder of MailKit, amongst many other titles, um, which we'll get into shortly. Um, yeah, it's good to be back. Welcome, everyone. Hey, nice to be here. <laughs> Fantastic. It's been a few months, I must say, and uh, me and Florian want to keep this project alive and it's fantastic to have you on, Jakob. And I know that we we did mention this a while back, but uh, nothing. Anyway, it's good to, good, to have you, good to have you on board. And Florian, I know that you have, you're dying to ask some questions straight away. Oh, uh, no, no, no. no I'd, I just wanted to, yeah, first of all, um, welcome um, Jakob. And um, where this is coming from is um, I... Um, I had some email exchange with uh, Jakob um, already back in, um, I think, October, September. And we were speaking about the, the Gmail pilot with Beamy and some other stuff around it. And uh, then we decided to postpone this talk to later this year, December, um, because there should be some updates regarding uh, Gmail and how they use Beamy. And, um, and secondly, um, I had a presentation uh, recently during CSA Summit about the topic of BIMI and how it's being used as a trust seal. And again, at that point, Jakob had some uh, comments um, uh, on that end and said that there's some sort of misconception as well. So probably we can kick it off with that, Jakob. Um, um, yeah. Sure. So, so the, the important thing is uh, to, to remember what BIMI stands for. The, it's a brand identification. And, uh, you know, that, that shouldn't be uh, just uh, exchanged for trust because uh, trust is something that is really hard to get, and especially in email. And if you, if you exchange the two terms, uh, that could be very tricky because if you look at your mailbox uh, today, uh, whether it's Gmail or it's Yahoo or it's your app on, on the phone, you will be seeing a lot of logos, right? You will be seeing them no matter whether those senders use Beamy or not. Because those, those logos, or it could be um, uh, contact photos, are coming from various different sources. Uh, could be your contact list, could be social networks, could be uh, logos that the um, mailbox provider uh, manually fetched in. And none of those give you any trust information. They, they give you uh, a visual representation of the sender, uh, which may or may not be correct. So just by uh, having Beanie as a brand identification and having having it uh, use a valid logo or a logo that uh, the the sender controls doesn't necessarily convey any trust. I personally uh, objected the the whole Beanie idea in. At first, uh, I think it's three years ago when, when the, the whole idea started being discussed within MOD and it was presented as uh, a trust indicator. And I objected exactly because of this, because how do you make a distinction whether that logo you're seeing in your inbox comes from a 
Houdini record, or it comes from uh, your address book, or it comes from uh, Facebook, LinkedIn connection, whatever the source might be. So since you cannot tell which, uh, which was the source of the logo, how can you suddenly say that there's trust behind that? And I wasn't the only one who objected and we actually ran a, a, a test with multiple brands and, uh, and the mailbot provider, which uh, did um, a split test where 50% of receivers would see a logo uh, and 50% of receive, uh, receive, receivers wouldn't. And we tried various different presentations of logos, just a simple logo or a check mark, you know, a shield, uh, check mark with a description, what it means, etc., to see how people interact with with messages that are marked as trusted. And no matter what we try, uh, all of the results in, in this AD test had the same outcome. There is no difference in user behavior. So there is no trust. It's not like when you see a logo, you suddenly are more likely to open the email. Or when you see that the message has been marked as trusted by the mailbox provider, that you would be more likely to click on the links in an email. So there is no inherent trust. You trust the lock on the door because it's hard to open the door without the key. So that's why you have trust. But it's really difficult for mailbox providers to convey the trust that they put in in the information that drives the beam in the beam line to convey that to the user. Now you uh, referenced uh, in, in your presentation, you, you referenced the, the Twitter uh, mm. trust card. And uh, I don't think it's, it's the same because A, on Twitter, you are specifically looking to check, do I trust this person? So do I trust these tweets? It's because you learned through all the past problems of fraudulent tweets uh, that there is a certain indicator of verified account that you will be looking whether that indicator is present or not. Again, it doesn't really convey trust in the content, right? So the fact that you know Donald Trump is a verified, uh, a verified Twitter account doesn't make his statement true or false, right? True. So it's really difficult to convey trust and. It's not only be me or Twitter, it's, it's the same with the green bar. It essentially, the, the test that we did uh, was also uh, based on a previous study that was done years ago about the trust uh, indication in, in the browsers, the green bar, which no longer exists. You know, you don't see a green bar anymore, even though uh, there are these extended validation certificates. And the only reason why, they, why there is no green bar is because people did not understand that trust. So how, how should we do it then? What, what, what I mean, uh, in, in general, yeah, you mentioned that the problem is that people don't understand it or um, don't know about um, the, the trust here, but um, in general, it's not a bad idea, right? Um, 
however we we um presented with a logo or a blue tick or whatever how how we presented in general it would be good to have a trust seal and people understand it but how can we implement it or would you say the only possibility um is that that ISPs have to filter mail in, in the inbox that is trusted and in the spam folder that, that is not trusted? Or should we introduce something but, but, like an additional folder like untrusted or whatever? That, that, but that's what you, you essentially already have. Like you trust Gmail to do the filtering for you, right? Or your mailbox provider. And that's why you have inbox, that's why you have promotions, and that's why you have a spam folder. Now, it's really, I, I agree that it would be great if there was a way how to convey trust, an absolute trust in an email. But is that something that the mailbox providers would want to do? If you pay for it, um, <laughs> not possibly. <laughs> it's, I, I don't think it's a, it's a, a monetary issue. I think it's, a, it's really a risk assessment. Like, yeah. even in, in the model of uh, uh, trusted dialogue, which is the, the German uh, service where you can get your logo into the into the mailbox for uh, for GMX and WebD and Freenet, etc. Yeah. With the paid service, it doesn't mean that you are not being filtered by the anti-spam engine. It doesn't guarantee deliverability or any of that even though it's a paid service. And that's absolutely correct from, from the mailbox providers not to do such an exception because that's a, that's a rabbit hole, right? Actually, I'm not sure about there. that. Actually, I think it includes uh, inbox guarantee and, um, and also hides the spam button. That's part of trusted dialogue. Um, I, I think that's the case. Well, I've read, I've read the terms and we have a couple of, uh, couple of customers uh, that are using trusted dialogue and paying yeah. for trusted dialogue and uh, you don't think so I, I, I think but, you but have the point to... is, look uh, if now imagine that the mailbox providers would decide that okay I completely trust these messages no matter what, because they are DMARC signed, policies, VJAC, everything is absolutely trustworthy. And therefore, the, the, the recipient should absolutely trust me. Create a, a special folder for it. Uh, I don't know, put an extra ribbon, whatever the, the UI presentation would be. Uh, and then this gets views. It, and th this could be uh, really uh, something as simple as, you know, an ex employee still has an account with the, uh, to access the ESP platform, sends out uh, a fake email yeah. from the brand's, uh, brand's uh, account. So it will align, everything will be absolutely spot on perfect, except it will point to phishing links or, you know, his own website. Yeah, yeah. Now, yeah, I've, I've, got, I've, I've got an observation. If, if I was the mailbox provider, I wouldn't want to be, respon uh, be uh, responsible for this. Yeah. You know, to take the responsibility of saying, this is absolutely trustworthy. So BIMI is not a trust indicator. And I don't think it should be considered a trust indicator. It's a brand indicator. It, like, I like the fact that in the mailbox, I see uh, photos of people, logos of brands, because it helps me identify uh, the sender. It's quicker. It's
it's more convenient, especially in Lula, it's more convenient than reading who's the sender. That's why people like it. Yeah. Yeah, I do happen to agree with you, Jakob. Uh, what, what I'd say, a couple of points. In terms of the trust um, factor, I think that was, it's more so to use to drive numbers up, I'd say, or to help early adoption. I, I don't see it necessarily as, um, first and foremost, all 100% trust out of the box. But um, with the marketeers and whatnot, looking at their brands, um, it is, I mean, it helps to have your DMARC policy. It does, all these things are a positive thing. And if you kind of hide behind the trust element, let's say, you can drive numbers up. Um, I wouldn't say it's, uh, you know, 100% trustworthy per se. And just going back to your original comment, um, and this may be a, a, a side question. So once you've validated everything and you have a logo and you said that it's hard to validate the exact logo or of your company um, and someone could, pretend to to be uh, the logo per se or have a logo on their same domain how are the how are the logos vetted how do how does a consumer know that that logo is kind of copyrighted or the official logo maybe maybe that's a, there's a simple mechanism there i haven't seen okay so uh right now the 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 yahoo which is the only uh Netflix provider that is uh uh, generally supporting uh, uh, Bimi is not doing uh, any betting in terms of uh, having a real uh, legal process to bet the logos. And the display is driven by sender reputation and uh, brand recognition. So when Yahoo's algorithm decides there's sufficient volume, this is a brand, uh, we, get, we can pull the logo because uh, DMARC is, is in place and the reputation is sufficient, they will display the logo. Now the Beaming standard also contains a part that is called verified mark certificate, uh -huh. which is about proving ownership. And this is the part that uh, why, why the Gmail pilot is not just you know something super simple. It's because Google will require uh, the, the Beamy logo to be certified, to have the verified mark certificate, which is the similar process as the, um, when, when, you, when you need a certificate for your website, uh, it's the same process as the extended validation, where uh, in this case, you're not only proving that you, know, you own the domain and the company requesting that certificate exists and it's valid, but in this case, you need to prove the ownership of the logo, right? And this this is uh, this is quite tricky because uh, you know there are many brands that have logos that uh, have various types of representations, uh, yeah. and they have logo manuals and. Uh, uh, all of this that decides which logo gets used when and where, but uh, and they have a history. But how do you how do you make sure that it's actually that company's logo, right? Mm -hmm. Now forget the big ones uh, that you know and you've been seeing for years. But look at the the small businesses. You know that they're using the logo because you're you're familiar with it because. The business is on your street and you've been seeing it for years and what you don't know is whether that logo is really unique yeah. so this is where uh the vnc process solves the yeah. problem by relying on existing methods and the only only existing method of course is the trademark so get you mm -hmm. once you have no, that makes sense. a verified mark certificate uh, for your Vimeo logo, you must be able to provide a trademark for that logo, which needs to be a visual mark. 
And yeah. um, do you have any insights about costs already? Was there discussion about that? Yes, well, so the, the original cost, uh, cost structure uh, that we were presented uh, was, from our perspective, it was really steep for uh, small businesses. And uh, uh, even European companies, because uh, in Europe, every every company is uh, running their email marketing uh, or most of them have a separate domain for each individual country yeah. now that easily adds up to have, having to have 20 25 uh, certificates yeah. which is you know quite different than having one dot com and problem solved so uh, even for European market, those, those prices, uh, the, the original prices that we saw were pretty steep. Uh, there is no official pricing at the moment, but we have seen uh, the, the proposed pricing uh, of one of the certification authorities where uh, it seems like there will be uh, uh, a volume-based uh, model, model for brands that have multiple domains. So uh, they, if they have 20 domains, then it will be, the price per domain will be considerably uh, cheaper than if you're getting just one certificate for one domain. So that is good. Uh, overall, it seems uh, that we're talking uh, Around nine hundred to thousand uh, dollars for a single uh, single VNC, and then it goes down to hundreds when you when you one you, time uh, or monthly. Uh, that's for a year. For a year, okay. Yeah, I was going to say, do do, uh, do you think there'll ever be some kind of solution in place for small businesses, small volume senders? I mean, is this just a the big players game so to speak the big brands who have these budgets i'm just thinking of the small business around the corner that they want to have this trust element because everyone else has um and consumers will start to pick up you know when the big brands are using it and oh we've got a logo we want a logo kind of thing um you know will there, will there ever be a solution for the small the small players the small businesses first off it's not a trust element it's, no, you, no, you're right. Sorry, when I say that, I'm saying in inverted commas. I, okay. I also, I'm with you on this one, but I, I'm, I'm yeah. playing to, you know, the. Oh. Okay. Uh, so, <laughs> this is a, this is not, a, not, a, not a trust on it. It's, it's a marketing, marketing thing, purely a marketing thing, getting extra visibility, uh, and. I totally support that because it is, and it has it has been called that by other people as well. It's the carrot you get for deploying BMAR. You've done all the work. Now, this is your reward. For that, for that, <laughs> right? Yeah, brilliant. Uh, yeah. But, uh, there is definitely a path for the small businesses because it's not only the small businesses, you know, uh, government institutions don't have trademarks, right? It's, it's a lot of, uh, a lot of there, there's a, a lot of world out there outside of the big corporations with uh, trademarks, right? Mm -hmm. Or even medium-sized businesses with trademarks. Uh, or small businesses with trademarks, you know, there is a lot of businesses and uh, a lot of institutions that could benefit. And there, A, while now we are talking about, let's say, $1,000 uh, per year for, for the validation, for, for the verification, uh, these prices will come down for sure. Uh, 
the standard also allows you to self-certify, right? So you claim that you certify yourself uh, and it's up to the up to the mailbox provider to decide whether they trust it uh, based on other factors that they know about you or not. Then in addition to that, there's also uh, a third party um, trusted uh, certification uh, possibility within the, within the standard where it wouldn't be necessarily a certification authority, but a trusted third party who would vouch. Mm. Right? So I could issue a certificate for you or deliverability TV. And if Google trusts my certificates, even though I'm not a CA or my list provided, then uh, the logo will display. I would love so, that, by the way, because uh, Yahoo doesn't like us. <laughs> doesn't well, you probably don't have the, the sufficient, Personally. right? Uh, we don't but, have the volume yet. But there, there are these uh, these additional options how to how to get the, the visibility, how to get your brand display. Uh, and, you know, I'm not the only one. I We are not the member of the Vimy group, uh, but we are in contact with uh, Vimy group. We are in the category called Friends of Vimy uh, within the Vimy group. Uh, and uh, we have contributed to, to the standard uh, one of whether it's BIMI itself or the BIMI SVG standard, um, we, we are talking to them and they do know that there are these issues with the small businesses and it's, it's going to be addressed properly. Uh, but at this stage, it's important to get, uh, get through the pilot and test all of the all of the difficulties, right? And we were the ones who, who were pushing for for this pilot to uh, to focus more on, on on European brands, yeah. Rather than you know saying we, we tested it with uh, CNN and Bank of America and Air Canada, and that's it. We've done we've done the work. Of course, they they want to test properly. They they want to see it from. Uh, different angles, see the possible issues, right? Is, is so, there any other, other um, stuff you can share about this new test besides the fact that they also test European countries, is there, uh, companies, is there anything else? Or is that um, secret? Um, Florian like secrets, it's <laughs> top secrets. So it's not a public test. Uh, Who doesn't? I know that within the criteria there was uh, for for the applicants, uh, one of one of the things that was being considered is whether the brand has the visual uh, trademark or the text only. Mm -hmm. So, how will that be? Because uh, you know the applications were turned in. Now Google and whoever else uh, has to uh, make make the selection, make, make, uh, take the finalists, uh, and I I'm not involved, so I, I cannot tell. But given that the the form were were asking uh, about whether there's a, a visual uh, trademark, text only trademark, or no trademark at all, they will be trying multiple different approaches to, uh, to the, the process of certification and validation. So uh, it is uh, something to be, to be seen how, how that turns out. Uh, other than that, um, there's not much to say, really. 
Okay. <laughs> I have one Good. more. Um, and just uh, sorry, another point. You go for it, Florian. No, no, you. No, I was just going to say, I, I mean, personally speaking, I happen to like some of the. I'm not going to use the word trust. I've, uh, I've said it now. Um, so I like what DMARC, uh, excuse me, what BME is like, the prerequisites of BME, yeah? Because we're, we're always you know, advocates of best practices, DMARC reject policy, you know, making sure that you're aligned. Images are always aligned, domains are aligned strictly where possible. I love all that. But as a consumer, I guess, not necessarily even a consumer, I think we're playing a bit of a dangerous game by approaching an email being a free protocol and having some kind of costs involved to keep up with the market. Now, going off on a tangent slightly, and maybe another topic after Florence's point, is we're looking at, a, I saw the other day with uh, the senders are now playing, paying a premium to be uh, at the top of a, an inbox. I can't remember what provider it is. Maybe one of you two could um, fill me in. Yeah. But I'm just thinking we're going from, a, is it Yahoo? That you can pay a premium and you land on the, or is that yeah. some pilot? Or have I just made it up? Uh, a couple of providers in Eastern Europe offer those as yeah. well. I just, I'm just thinking, like, how how will this all pan out in the large, the bigger picture? I guess, you know, not necessarily just for the small businesses, but um, you know, uh, setting this precedence. You know, I, I I hear this a lot that you know email is free, but <laughs> there's nothing free about email, right? <laughs> Like you can sign up for a free. Everything is offset in, in, in a certain way. And if, if, if it was free, then there would be no ESPs. Like, we're not doing charity. MailKit is an ESP. We do charge our customers, surprisingly, for sending out emails, right? And I, I'm yeah. sure that uh, Matt does charge as well, right? So sure. yeah. yeah. what is free about email from... From uh, if you look at look at it from the recipient's perspective, yes, they feel like it's free because years ago Gmail pushed this idea unlimited free mailbox, right? Mm -hmm. It's upset by the ads that they're running in the mailbox. That's correct. Yeah. So it's not really free, and the biggest biggest cost that nobody's seeing and nobody's looking at is actually the infrastructure cost for the mailbox providers because if you look at what the volume is mm. you know it's not the, the emails that i sent to you uh planning scheduling this meeting it's all the bulk emails from marketers yeah. That's their major storage cost. They're, of course, trying to upset that uh, by the ads, uh, by add on services, etc. But there is nothing free about that. Yeah. And, you know, there is nothing wrong with them trying to find new business models uh, to monetize that free email because the, the only ones who are monetizing the emails at the moment really well are actually the brands. The brands are, by sending the emails are monetizing like crazy. You know, every time you get that mail from eBay trying to uh, tell you what others bought and whether you need a new uh, iPhone cover, that's monetizing email by eBay. Gmail doesn't get a cut yeah. on that sale, right? I, I agree, and it's tricky because um, Gmail um, doesn't advertise that obviously. They um, they use the data and so on. Other uh, smaller ISPs um, without those abilities have to uh, spread more advertisement in the um, inboxes, and they doesn't look as good as Gmail. So that's a challenge. 
And I also think that that's why they try to find additional ways like adding premium services. Italia Online does yeah. it, WPPL does it and so on. And in my eyes, it's a fair business as well. So why not? They have the cost. They must. Just, just, a, just, a, just, a, just, one, just one counter on that. And I know you mentioned about ads, um, but I suppose as a consumer, you're, you're kind of giving over a lot of your data, a lot of your trends data that sometimes are sold on um, like the way your behavior, the brands that you like and whatnot, are they not making mo enough money from doing that? Ooh. Possibly not. Well, for, for, okay, for example, for example, Gmail, when you open Gmail. Oh, for, sure. Have, for sure, it yeah. is, but they're in a unique situation. Don't forget that they, they run the AdWord, they run the Google Analytics, they run the whole yeah. suite. So they are doing Fine, I'm not worried about Google or Alpha. I'm not worried either. I'm not worried either. Right? They're doing fine. But uh, if you smaller. look at smaller, smaller mailbox, mailbox yeah. providers, they are not, they they don't agree. have that advantage, right? And even Yahoo, who is massive, Verizon Media is not a uh, SME, but again, their cost for operating a service like email are going crazy with the amount of bulk that is being sent. And I already know about quite a few uh, mailbox providers that are supporting BME. They cannot wait for, uh, for BME to start really rolling out. And they have their systems either ready yeah. or uh, are close to getting it done because BIMI essentially helps them replace part of their existing infrastructure for uh, handling uh, logos, but those will be paid services. So you want your BIMI to display in, in, in this mailbox provider's inbox, you have to pay for it as a brand. Yes, yeah. uh, uh, actually, let me um, come back to one important point um, from from Bimi and um, also to um, to highlight a little bit um, Jakob's uh, Bimi inspector, which I really like. It's a tool to uh, to check your records and check how the logo will display once it's set up correctly and so on. So it's a great tool and probably we can link that. Um, one question, and I am asking that myself that question since I heard from Bimi from the first time, why is it so complicated to create a, um, a correct logo? Because it has to be in a specific SVG format. There's not really good converters. Um, and, and my question is, why don't we have a converter that can simply transform a pixel-based image into a valid SVG image? Why, is, uh, why are the hurdles that big? And is there not any way to make this easier? What okay, so when, when uh, Bimi started, the, the original idea was there will be a logo in SVG. Yeah. And that was it. That was like three years ago. Let's do an SVG logo. And uh, we actually started uh, building the validator because we haven't seen any uh, validator that would actually validate what's in the BIMI record other than whether the syntax is correct back then. So uh, whatever you put in, it would work, no matter if that URL pointing to the logo was a PNG file. So we started validating what, what's actually in that record and what's what's the what's the file and that's where we started seeing a lot of the issues and we started uh sending the feedback to the bimmy group about the need to create an svg standard that would be specific to uh to bimmy uh and there was a there was a lot of discussion about what should and what shouldn't be allowed because the SVG is a very broad standard. And the first thing we saw were SVGs 
that were essentially just the containers for the bitmap. Yeah. Nothing else. So there was a bitmap PNG wrapped in an SVG. That's not a scalable vector graphic. No. That's just a bitmap, which doesn't scale. So it's difficult for the mailbox providers to take that bitmap image and scale it for various devices or various use cases, right? So that's why you really need an SVG. And it's really difficult to convert a bitmap into a scalable image. Now you can you can give it a shot, take uh, take Adobe Illustrator, which is a desktop full-size application that has been developed for years and years. And it has some image tracing features that will help you convert the bitmap into, uh, into vectorized data. But you still need to be uh, a designer to turn that into a really good output, right? Yeah. So the idea of us or anyone just creating uh, a converter that would do it uh, flawlessly without the hitch for any logo you put in, uh, that's not realistic. That's the first problem. Uh, the, the second thing is 99% of brands do have a vectorized logo because without a vectorized logo in Adobe Illustrator, Carl Draw, or whatever format you might use, you cannot do, uh, you know, prints, uh, printed ads, you know, billboards. Uh, it's simply not possible. So, ninety-nine percent of brands do have the logo in yeah. vectorized format that can be converted into an SVG. It's usually that the marketers who are in charge of this or the people who are trying to implement logo, they don't have this. That's why the first thing that we started to uh, check was, is that SVG uh, an actual SVG or is that an image wrapped in an SVG? And that also dictated that the tag for the uh, bitmap images shouldn't be allowed within the SVG, right? And we progressed from there. There are so many things in the SVG standard that could be abused. In theory, I'm not saying that they are going to be abused, but could be abusable. That there these needed to be needed to be curved, curved and a separate uh, format of SVG, a subset called Tiny Portable Secure, needed to be created. Aha! Uh -huh. I, I was going to just that just brings me on to another observation. So I, instead of using Adobe, I'd use GIMP because it's open source. So the complication for me would be where you convert it into SVG, and then after you have to um, edit the SVG, unless the program adds in the version, and uh, I think the tiny PS, as you mentioned, the version tiny PS, and also the base profile, but you'd still need to edit the code and whatnot. So you would need some technical knowledge behind that, or you, your marketing team would need some support. It would we be are, interesting to know, yeah. We are working on, on, a, on a tool that will uh, do a, a conversion uh, if, Very good. The, if the input uh, SVG meets certain criteria and allow you essentially to throw in the SVG, it will tell you, it, it will analyze it. And if it's convertible, then it will ask you, do you want us to give it a shot? If mm -hmm. you select yes, then we will try to do the, the conversion of, of, of the SVG into a tiny PS and remove whatever uh, unnecessary stuff is there 
and present you with the result. And then you can select, okay, this looks like my, my logo, or you say, no, this doesn't look like my logo anymore. Because there's just so many elements that yeah. uh, could, uh, could be, uh, that, that might need to be removed from the SVG, from the input file, that yeah. uh, the, the, the result might look completely different. Yeah, very good, uh, very good. That you use Jim, but Jim is not uh, a vector graphics software, right? It's uh, it's like Photoshop, not like Illustrator. So, uh, I want to do our best to provide the tools that will help really the, the, the end user to get their uh, BME uh, in place, including the, the SVG files and everything. That is my goal. And I support BME because it can provide added value to everyone in the ecosystem, right? The recipients love it because they see they see the logos. Yeah. Yeah. Mailbox providers love it because there's an opportunity for them for monetization. There's uh, opportunity for them, even without monetization, to give this uh, value to the marketers for marketers deploying DMARC properly. And proper DMARC deployment helps mailbox providers to cut costs on uh, email filtering. Yeah. So there's value for them, whether they monetize or not. And for ESPs, we as ESPs, we can monetize this as well because many, uh, many of our clients will need help consulting. Uh, whether it's on, on the BIMI side or the DMARC side. So, yeah. you know, everyone in the ecosystem is, uh, is happy. Win, win, win. Yeah, it's definitely a win, win, win. The, the, the biggest problem that I see is that this can go south if everybody uh, tries to make this into a cash cow. Right and uh, yeah. you know, whether it's whether it's uh, super expensive uh, super expensive certificates or you know barriers of entry that's that's the important here yeah and barriers are low and right now they are fairly low with Yahoo the the barriers are almost uh, none. If you have a good reputation and you're a brand and you're sending a low entry point, yeah. And it will show within a couple of days. Yeah, true. And yep. if it doesn't, then Yahoo is very responsive when it comes to uh, working out what the problems are. And they are using our validator and uh, we get a lot of feedback from the data that we process. And we have processed over uh, over 100,000 uh, logos in our validator. Wow, so, very good. So that, that's a, there is a demand for, for BME. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not the judge to say whether 100,000 is a niche or it's big enough for uh, for the for the mailbox providers to take notice of. Mm -hmm. I'm inclined to say that if, if there are hundred thousand uh, brands in the world that have already tried to play around with uh, with Vimy, then it's definitely worth taking seriously. Yeah, and uh, yeah. Yeah, let's hope um, that uh, that the monetization, like the certificate costs and so on, um, will not um, 
lead to the fact that uh, companies can participate because then yeah. uh, I, I agree uh, this can just be become a standard um, the more people participate and the more ISPs of course display it. Yeah, but yeah. we have to still keep in mind that certificates are not required. They are optional. Also for Gmail, Gmail will require. Yeah. We know that Yahoo will require certificates as well in the future, right? Just to say, it is optional for Gmail, although Gmail is no, no, no. It's the largest. I... Standard. It's optional. Uh -huh. Standard. Uh -huh. Okay, excuse me. Right. Required by Gmail. In the future, it will be required by Yahoo as well, from what we were uh, what we were told. Whether that future comes uh, next year or in two years or three years or maybe never, that's uh, hard to say. I'm more inclined to believe that Gmail will require the certificates uh, during uh, during maybe first year, and then we'll start to. Uh, kind of reduce those requirements and allow third-party certifications, uh, allow additional methods and use more of their, uh, more of their uh, reputational data to uh, do the decision-making whether the logo should be displayed or not and whether the logo is trustworthy or not, because that's that's their their biggest issue. They want yeah. to make sure that someone who deploys DMARC uh, has the, the the sufficient reputation, doesn't start using logo of a bank, yeah. right? Even though they are not the bank, or a logo that would be confusing. So. Uh, but I'm sure that, you know, there are ways and how to make it uh, more accessible uh, for small businesses. And it, then it, in the end, there, there won't be much of a difference for a small business, mm. right? Because still you have to keep in mind that if if it's set up from from the get-go for small businesses then you would have to face a lot of small issues and try to work them out with thousands and thousands maybe hundreds of thousands of individual uh, partners while Going from top down, it's much easier. You work out the, the main issues on the big big ones, and then you can scale it to to the smaller ones. Yeah, well, one concern that we um, we had or that customers mentioned is, what if we implement Vimi and the logo is shown, and then, for example, you mentioned yeah, who was thinking about um, also requiring certificates. What if you then don't buy one and suddenly your logo isn't displayed anymore? Is that not, um, can, or can this cause um, uh, the downside of trust? Um, can this cause uh, that, that users then assume but, <laughs> you're not the, the right company anymore? You're, you're, you're still looking at it that there's a trust. I, I don't, but, but, but what, no, no, what if you... <laughs> <laughs> what if you there's no data that would uh, that would show that there is any any impact right so we did the test uh we we tested what's the impact of being yeah just being and you said it's zero no okay it's one percent no open difference that's not st statistically significant uh Every presentation that I saw that uh, refers to, you know, Yahoo saying that there's a 10% increase. Yeah. That's misrepresentation. That uh, 
Um, that increase that Yahoo mentioned, or Marcel mentioned, was originally referred to the DMAR policy in force. Hmm. So, yes, it's all about DMAR. And if you do it at the same time, right? If you do it, go to DMARC enforcement and deploy DME, then you will see the 10% spike or certain increase in uh, open rates thanks to better deliverability. And you can attribute it to, oh, people love the logo, but that's not the case. That okay. increase in open rates is caused by the DMARC enforcement. So, By the way, is that is that uh, is there a publication around these findings? Um, you mentioned you you um, had a pre presentation about that on um, on the morgue, but is there also some sort of publication somewhere? No, it's uh, so it was it was uh, done within with uh, and presented within Mog. Uh, the parties involved did not agree to uh, publish the data outside of MOD, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. there was a, a discussion about uh, making a, a paper, writing a paper about uh, trust indicators in general uh, based on the data that we collected. But uh, no, I, I cannot uh, share those presentations and uh, the, the brands involved, etc. But back to the point now. So the, if we know that the impact is in DMARC and not, not being itself, not in the visibility of, of the logo, then if the, the requirements change and suddenly your logo is no longer displayed, then there will be no impact. Now, okay. this is theoretical because there is the inherent trust, and then there's the learned trust. So over the years, if over the years people start to expect the logo and they learn this trust towards the brand based on the logo, there might be implications, right? We don't have the answer for that because that requires first training the people to uh, get used to uh, the logo or specific uh, trust element or uh, user experience and then removing it. So we, we cannot definitely uh, have a definite answer to that, whether removing the logo or losing the, the ability to uh, show your logo will have negative impact in a year or two. Uh, when was this um, made, this observation? Um, your, your test, when did you make this? Um, two years ago? Two years ago. Okay, yeah, pr probably at that time there was the Google Plus also displaying logos for brands or at least the yeah. possibilities of, uh, yeah, least, the world's there, changing. There, you know, there's still so many, uh, so many ways how to get your logo into the into the Google user interface. Yeah. You create an account with that email address and add the <laughs> add the image to that account. Just, you just have got to hope they don't have any outages, because if there's an outage, then unfortunately you won't be able to. But it, you know, it's it's not just Google. It's uh, it's about all the mailbox providers and how this works uh, for, for the recipient. And, you know, in the end, if you, if you say like, what's the impact uh, when that logo goes away? Well, here's the thing. It's also very, uh, very helpful for the brand that if suddenly the logo disappears, they should start looking into, okay, so is it maybe that our reputation has gone down? they are no longer showing our brand? Yeah. Or is it, you know, because if you're a brand and you're looking at this as, a, as an additional uh, 
way of showcasing your brand, just a brand impression, then that, that's where the value is. And in fact, you're, you're right when you're looking at it as a brand impression. So if I was a brand manager, I would want to be me because of that, because it gives me additional way of uh, getting my brand visible directly to, uh, to the user and imprint that brand on the user. So if it disappears, if it's a matter of Yahoo requiring or you know, whatever mailbox provider suddenly requiring the, the requiring the BMC, I should get the BMC, right? It's yeah. you know, even if it was thousand dollars a year, yeah. For most brands, that's not a deal breaker. For the small companies, though, <laughs> sure, that might be tricky, but by then the prices will go down significantly. Just look at the, the, the SSL certificates. I remember a couple of years ago buying the certificate for $500. And now I buy it for seven, 10. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but the thing is, if you want SSL, you get an SSL certificate. If you go for a BIMI certificate, uh, the, the VMC certificate, and you expect your logo to be displayed and it's not shown, then uh, you might complain, I, I paid $1,000. Why why is my logo not being displayed? And the, Because your reputation has gone down here. Yeah, yeah, you sent to... The certificate is there, but your reputation is not there. That's not our problem. So who's You're the signing up to it. Who, yeah, who's the her, responsible party? The sender. So this is this is important that this needs to be presented directly. You're not buying into the Bini ecosystem. Yeah. You're getting your Bini logo certified that it's valid. That still having deployed Bini doesn't give you a guarantee that it will be displayed. It's conditional. And right? that might be a problem because then- It's important to tell this to, to the brands. Brands must know that this is not, you know, 100% guaranteed. The same way uh, we, over the years, we managed to explain to brands that there is no such thing as guaranteed email delivery. Yeah. Right. But but that's different things. I mean, uh, you're also working at an ESP, same as me. Um, th the first thing that my clients would ask is, um, can I actually test that before I pay the 1000 if I'm getting displayed if I pay that? And in the end, we, we can't, uh, we, we don't know that. We can't ask Google, can you please um, check if the reputation is good enough? Um, there's no such thing. Don't know if if they plan to um, to to do something like a tester um, that the oh uh, domain would be uh, applicable for for logo in case they had a certificate or not, or if Google just said we well, don't care. Yes, yes, uh, but you you could also you could also argue, look, uh, you've got an SSL for your website, right? It costs you some money. You have to renew that cert certificate every year. And the prices are going down. So uh, what was once $500 is now $10. But back then, when you know Chrome didn't force you to, uh, didn't show you any warnings about unsecured sites, et cetera, Back then, having the SSL was really a security feature for those who understood the value in it, right? Like banks who did, who needed it to protect uh, the data uh, in transit. But for most uh, most brands, this was not really necessary. It was. You know, they read on, on the SEO blogs that having the SSL certificate will boost your uh, SEO. 
there was no proof for them, yeah. right? So in, in many cases, this will this will be a matter of doing doing the right PR for for baby. Yeah. Right. To but avoid who's doing that and why. Yeah, who's... and and to avoid you know uh, false promises, to avoid you know telling telling brands uh, get a baby, it, it will improve your deliverability, or you will get. Uh, higher open rates or click rates because can we yeah I was going to say can we compare BME in a way and in a good way I suppose you know back in the day that return path monopolized certification market I mean there's obviously others CSA and and, uh, and others about but now instead of say an independent company like uh, return path profiting the ISPs now are thinking right we're doing our own certification and they can you know as you said support their own costs I'm just thinking out loud. I, I, I do prefer that model that rather than having one one place to cover all, you know, each ISP can manage differently. Okay. Yeah. It, it adds a bit more spice to the market, I think. That's just my two cents. Look, we how long have we been talking for, by the way? Sorry. <laughs> I just realized. How long have we been talking for? This is, yeah. this is uh, it's still a draft. It's, yeah. it's evolving. Um, we are working on our validator uh, constantly and trying to improve it so it provides the, uh, the users as much information about uh, why their uh, SUG fails or why they, their BIMI record fails as possible mm -hmm. so they can take the necessary steps. And in the end, it's, it's all about educating in, 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 the, in the right way. And I'm sure that once once all of this settles, a lot of a lot of the issues that we are uh, that are blockers at the moment for uh, small brands will simply disappear, because mm -hmm. most most big mailbox providers will treat it the same way. Will have the same approach to what uh, would be needed. That was, a, that was a perfect final sentence, I would say. <laughs> no, I mean, uh, we could uh, speak hours and hours about that. And I really enjoy talking to you. Um, uh, yeah, but I think um, we have <laughs> enough um, uh, enough topics to be to cover. Uh, um, we have covered enough topics. Um, um, already. Um, well, we haven't covered the SVG itself properly, but just, that's just, well, we, we're going to have to have we're going to have to have another video at least, and even on another topic as well, because I've I thoroughly yeah. enjoyed this. Yeah. Yeah. Let's let, let's let's do a follow up. I would say. Yeah, let's do the follow up. For you? We have the tool that. Uh, yeah. When, exactly. Once you when, uh, when, it, once when your tool is there, then we do a follow up the, and um, present it. When's the ETA on that, Jakob? Is that in the new year, Q1, Q2? Do you, um, I mean, is, you've got a good, yeah. Three months. Three months. They're fantastic. Perfect. All right. Cool. So in a couple of months, we will have this and we'll go public with it. And uh, we will definitely uh, test it first with uh, a couple of uh, known, uh, known partners of ours. But again, we. Since we did already test over 100,000 different logos, we do have uh, enough data to, to, to test. Cool. So I would fair love play, to, um, to have a follow up on this uh, once the tool is ready. And um, yeah, thanks a lot for the for the details, for your insights. And, uh, and for having me. You're welcome. Thanks, Jakob. Appreciate that. Anything else from you? Cheers, end? everyone. Okay, bye. see you. Thanks. Bye-bye. See you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.